Very good, very good. Right, got it. <clears throat> well, um, hello, uh, my name's Pete Falconer. I'm a senior lecturer in film and TV at the University of Bristol. Um, first of all, thanks very much to Sam for organising this and having me. Um, also, uh, just to quickly explain, my voice isn't usually like this. I'm recovering from an extended bout of laryngitis, um, but I'm hoping it'll just add a little bit of uh, add a little bit of colour, a little bit of flavour to the tonality of t uh, of today uh, today's talk. Um, yeah. If I have to mute myself at any point to cough or, or drink water or anything, please just be aware that any awkwardness you experience, I'm experiencing tenfold. Um, a small warning as well, there's the occasional bit of slight gore in my slides. It's nothing significant, and this is a talk on horror, so you might expect it, but, you know, just to let you know. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Australian horror movies in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, my main area of academic interest, as I tend to describe it, is the forms and genres of popular cinema. My first book was about westerns, but I've been working on horror movies for the past couple of years with a view to writing a second book on horror. Um, and it was in the process of starting my horror research in a serious way that I learned kind of about Australian horror films and gained a fondness for them. Since then, I've written a chapter on Australian horror um, and genre hybridity for a forthcoming collection called Reappraising Cult, uh, Cult Horror Films, and also appeared on the Dr. Kino podcast to discuss one of my favourite Australian movies, the 1982 action horror film Turkey Shoot. So part of the impulse behind this work and behind today's talk is my desire to share my interest in what remain some relatively underappreciated films. However, of course, I don't um, I don't want to kind of overstate the obscurity of my examples today. Many of these movies have been discussed and examined before, uh, particularly in Australia by Australians, but also increasingly in the rest of the world, especially in the past 15 years since the 2008 um, documentary, Not Quite Hollywood, which if you haven't seen, I greatly recommend. It's a, a, a lot of fun and, and, and full of great recommendations um, of movies. Since that documentary sparked a wider interest in so-called exploitation films. So, um, as you should already uh, have been able to tell, I am not Australian myself, and I make no special claims to cultural knowledge or insight. I am just a pom who has seen a decent number of Australian horror movies and thinks that they are interesting. So please um, bear that in mind and take everything I say with a pinch of colonial guilt. Um, so why then are horror movies, uh, Australian horror movies from the 1970s and 1980s interesting? First of all, because they take a rich variety of approaches uh, to the horror genre and make distinctive and expressive use of its conventions. Beyond the achievements of individual movies, though, it's also interesting to consider Australian horror in this period as a national genre cinema in dialogue with variations and traditions of horror from elsewhere in the world, finding its own place in the global horror genre and commercially in the global market for horror films. The period I'm talking about is a significant one in the history of the Australian horror film. And a fairly basic reason for this is that the Australian horror film didn't have much of a history before the 1970s. Making, importing and exhibiting horror films was banned by the Australian government between 1948 and 1969. Prior to that, there were a few Australian horror films that were made. You can like find a couple listed on IMDb and a couple in kind of scholarly discussions and things like that from the late silent and early sound periods, but there really weren't many. Um, just make sure my slides are all doing it. Yes, there is an interesting prehistory to the period that I'm focusing on. Um, and much of that is discussed in Daniel Best's recently released book, Terror Down Under, which, um, you know, giving a free plug to here. Because um, you know, as you see, it runs, his period that he discusses runs from the end of the um, 19th century until the early 1970s. Um, but my point here is that horror arguably wasn't established as a viable genre in Australian cinema until the 1970s. And even then, 
there still weren't that many Australian movies released in the uh, Australian horror movies released in the 1970s. It wasn't until the 1980s that Australian horror started to proliferate in any kind of real numbers, uh, boosted by a combination of domestic incentives and an international demand for horror movies, particularly for home video markets in that period. So um, despite the contrasts between the two decades, though, the 70s and the 80s are worth thinking about together as the period in which something that we could call modern Australian horror emerged and established itself. So I'll start by looking at a couple of notable themes and motifs that recur across Australian horror movies in the 1970s and 1980s. Something we see rather a lot of, and it's kind of unsurprising as it's pervasive across many different kinds of horror and more broadly in the Gothic, um, is that kind of quintessentially Gothic theme of conflict between the past and the present. And this um, theme is apparent in a film that kind of has a claim to, uh, to be considered and is sometimes considered the first major Australian horror movie. And that's Night of Fear from uh, 19... Yeah, uh, from 1972-73, depending on when you date it, uh, directed by Terry Burke. Um, and Night of Fear is, in several respects, an unusual film. It was initially uh, produced as the pilot episode of a television anthology series called Fright. But when the series wasn't picked up, the production company decided to release the episode uh, theatrically instead. And it was initially denied certification by Australia's Office of Film and Literature Classification, but then given the R rating, which was still new, um, on appeal in late 1972. The R rating was only just starting to be an option in Australian cinema at that time in the late 60s, early 70s. So Night of Fear being effectively banned and then unbanned generated some publicity for the release of the film, um, and, it, and it was shown in independent and drive-in cinemas where it was a, a commercial success. It is alleged to have broken box office records at the Penthouse Cinema in King's Cross in Sydney, although it's difficult to find specific data to substantiate this claim. So on the one hand, Night of Fear is an attempt to make a modern horror film in the style of those emerging at the time in the USA. It has some similarities, for example, to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, although it was made two years before. Um, on the other hand, it also remains something of a curiosity. As a 55-minute television pilot, it is, it is unusually short for a theatrically released feature film. It also has almost no dialogue, giving it at least a slight resemblance to a silent film. I'll get more directly to its treatment of that kind of thematic tension between past and present, but it's worth noting that this tension can be even seen at a formal level in the film, in its unusual combination of tradition and experimentation, established conventions and incongruous departures. Anyway, to my main point here, Night of Fear has a contemporary setting. It's set in early 70s New South Wales, kind of mainly in the sort of outskirts of Sydney. In its pre-title sequence, however, it could almost be a period film. There's an image there from it. Um, so, yeah, the pre-title sequence. A woman riding a horse is menaced by a grotesque hermit living in a cabin in the woods. The hermit kills the horse and then locks the woman in the cabin to meet an unseen fate. Roll opening titles. Apart from a couple of details of costuming and set design, most prominently the electrical fuse box that you can see at the Hermit's shack, there is very little that would identify the setting as anything later than the very early 20th century. As if to reinforce this, uh, in this sequence, we repeatedly see a gravestone marking the final resting place of someone who died in 1902. Um, after the title sequence, however, we're shown a very different world, that of the modern Australian middle class, um, you know, circa the early 1970s. You see a woman taking a shower in what is either a, a swanky apartment or a, an upscale hotel room uh, where a man still sleeps in the bed. And we see a champagne bottle and glasses from the night before. After this, another man drives away from his suburban home 
his wife and children waving him off. The suburban man and the freshly showered woman meet at a sports club and have a game of tennis. After their game, they have sex in the bushes nearby. They appear to be having some sort of illicit affair. So Night of Fear begins then by juxtaposing two worlds, a malevolent animalistic world associated with the countryside and the past, and an almost soap opera world of suburban middle-class leisure and complicated personal entanglements. The two worlds are then almost immediately brought together. The woman uh, from the apartment, from the shower, from the tennis, not the woman who rode the horse, um, Neither of them are given names. Almost no one in this film has a name because of the lack of dialogue. Uh, But yes, in any case, shower tennis woman returning from her tryst uh, gets into a car accident and gets stuck on a dirt road. Um, Her subsequent encounters with the hermit from the pre-credit sequence and her attempts to escape him form most of the rest of the film's narrative. So although road signs indicate that the area in which the hermit lives is only about 14 miles outside of Sydney, uh, it feels considerably more isolated and remote than that. In this respect, the film could be said to be making use of Australia's quite distinctive geography. As a lot of you are no doubt aware, the majority of the population of the large island continent is concentrated in cities on its southeastern coast, while most of the kind of interior of the country especially is made up of more sparsely populated rural and uncultivated lands. This is highlighted in another Australian movie, the 1981 horror suspense thriller Road Games, uh, directed by Richard Franklin, who I will return to. Uh, This film follows a truck driver on his route from Melbourne to Perth, with much of the middle of the film set in the relative emptiness of the Nullarbor Plain. Uh, Night of Fear plays with a similar contrast. Once they're outside of the city, the characters are in a different world. It is almost as if they kind of left uh, developed modern civilization behind and traveled back in time. The environment, the environment in which the woman finds herself, apart from, as you can see, a few modern building materials left by the side of the road, seems untouched by much of the 20th century. Even going back to an example I picked out, um, the fuse box at the hermit's cabin is revealed to conceal uh, to conceal um, a more low tech system of ropes and hatches, uh, which he uses. It's finally revealed that he uses this to release hungry rats that eat his victims alive. So I want to pick up on this kind of suggestion of time travel, almost this idea that kind of you leave the city and suddenly you're kind of back in the past uh, that kind of gets expressed in this movie. And the suggestion is kind of literalized in a later Australian horror movie, Frenchman's Farm from 1987. Uh, In this film, the main character, Jackie, a law student based in Brisbane, is transported back from the 1980s to the 1940s while driving through rural Queensland. She witnesses a murder on Frenchman's farm uh, before being returned to the 1980s where she investigates the past incident that she saw. The relationship between past and present here um, connects to matters of geography and social class in similar ways to those that I've kind of pointed up um, in Night of Fear. If we were to do a kind of Jim Kitsey's Horizons West style uh, table of oppositions, and I realize my background writing about Westerns is showing through somewhat here, it might look a bit like this. So, yeah, you've got the, on the one side, you've got the past, the rural and the poor. And on the other side, you've got the present, the urban and the rich. And that's kind of how they how they align thematically. The infringements farm it's quickly established that Jackie uh, comes from quite an affluent background. She drives with a Ford Mustang convertible um, and her parents support her, uh, pay her way through law school. In both Frenchman's Farm and Night of Fear, then films are about 15 years apart, relatively wealthy characters from the city encounter monstrous or supernatural phenomena in the countryside, which is associated with poverty in the past. And this also resembles the strand of so-called urbanoia 
which uh, Carol Clover identifies in American rape, revenge and related movies, including De Deliverance, The Hills Have Eyes and I Spit on Your Grave in her still mag magisterial work, Men, Women and Chainsaws, the book that made me want to be an academic, arguably. Um, so it makes sense that Australian horror films would be engaging with some of the themes and preoccupations of the wider horror genre from around the same time. A part of what distinguishes the Australian treatment of these issues, though, is the extent to which the comforts and protections of modernity are depicted as precarious. In the American movie that uh, movies that Clover discusses, um, city folk tend to have to travel a little bit further to find out of the way places where they are this vulnerable. In Night of Fear, for example, as I mentioned, the modern world has little meaningful reach once we're only a few miles outside of Sydney. So we see this in other Australian horror films from the period in which modernity and its trappings are either fragile and inadequate in the face of more ancient primal forces or very easily corrupted and harnessed by those forces. In Long Weekend, uh, for example, uh, both the main characters are killed when nature turns modern technologies against them. First, noises in the night frighten the husband, Peter, into accidentally shooting his wife, Marsha, with a spear gun. Um, then Peter himself is hit by a truck when a bird attacks the driver. Not the clearest of stills there, but that's a bird flapping at a truck driver's face there in the slide. Um, in Thirst, very interesting Australian horror film, not a wholly satisfying one, but a very interesting one, um, Modern industrial farming techniques, as well as forms of physical and psychological therapy, are usurped by an ancient order of aristocratic vampires. In a range of different ways in these and other examples, the modern world is presented as something that's barely established and vulnerable to overwhelming forces from the past. This theme is sometimes developed in ways that connect it explicitly to Australian history and culture. So one example of this is the 1981 film Alison's Birthday, in which the relationship between the past and the present is mapped onto the relationship between Britain and Australia. So I discussed this theme in the recent chapter that I wrote on genre hybridity in Australian horror, and I'll just kind of reproduce a short passage from that chapter here. So I'm, I'm quoting myself in that sort of most masturbatory of academic actions, but please forgive me. Um, so in Alison's birthday, Britain is associated with the past and represents an unwelcome, even parasitic burden on modern Australia. The character Alison Finlay has been raised to be the new vessel for an ancient Celtic demon brought to Australia by its previous host, her English grandmother. Alison's aunt and uncle have a Stonehenge-like circle at the bottom of their garden where the transference ritual ultimately takes place and the film plays on the incongruity of this feature in a suburban garden and in Australia more broadly. So Alison's birthday ends with Alison's consciousness waking up in her 104-year-old grandmother's body. The horror of loss of identity and premature ageing is linked to a change in nationality from Australian to British. So, yeah, the, done quoting myself. Uh, apologies again. But, yeah, Alison's birthday develops this theme of generational predation with the old preying on the young. And that, again, can be seen elsewhere in the horror genre. For example, in 1960s and 1970s British horror movies like The Sorcerers and Frightmare. However... Connecting this theme to the relationship between Australia and its colonisers gives it a distinctive and kind of resonant inflection in this particular case. So unsurprisingly, all things British can be treated with significant ambivalence in Australian culture. There are impulses both to emulate British examples and to critique and reject them. An alternative model in the Anglophone world, inevitably, given its dominant position in uh, global popular culture, is the USA. The Australian film critic Alexandra Hella Nicholas uh, notes 
quote, the active presence of dual cultural colonial pressures in Australian cinema, with uh, prestige filmmaking conventionally coded as British influenced, while mainstream genre cinema is associated with America. Uh, these competing pressures have some, sometimes presented significant challenges for Australian horror films. By the mid-1970s, government funding for film productions was dominated by that Anglophile prestige model. It was very difficult for genre films to get any support from the Australian Film Commission. On the other hand, uh, the Australian horror movies that were made were also still compelled to distinguish themselves from Hollywood and to avoid seeming overly derivative of American genre cinema. Um, so, yeah, kind of caught between uh, two models kind of regarded as either impossible or undesirable. And different Australian horror films position themselves differently in this landscape. Some embraced more of a kind of British-derived style. The influence of Hammer, for example, can be seen in such films as Thirst, which I've already mentioned, Next of Kin, and Cassandra. And other films em emulated American models. Uh, the film Nightmares is an attempt to make it, uh, the Australian version of a Halloween-style slasher film, while the recreated Midwestern setting in Dead Kids, um, which I've included in the slide there, creates an uncanny simulacrum of, of Americana. You know, you've got the kind of dino waitress uniform and the convertible car and things there. Like I thought it would give you a little bit of Americana in just in that image. Um, and the actress is it Louise Fletcher as well, the, the American actress. Um, well, I'll come back to overseas performers towards the end. Um, at least one Australian horror film made this kind of conflict of cultural pressures into a particularly overt theme. Um, so if those of you are familiar with The Howling, the Joe Dante werewolf movie from the early uh, 1980s, um, you may know that it has continued to generate and uh, proliferate sequels over the years, uh, including the distinctly Australian Howling 3, The Marsupials. Uh, and part of the backstory of this film involves a 19th century colonial genocide of Australian marsupial werewolves. And this genocide is jointly commanded uh, by the American president and the British crown. Now, much of Howling 3 takes a somewhat more optimistic view of international relations, but Australia's longstanding cultural relationships with um, Britain and the USA are subject to satirical critique. Um, other horror films sought to emphasise distinctively Australian settings or subject matter, like the emphasis on um, wildlife and the environment in movies like Long Weekend, Razorback and Dark Age, or the evocation of historical atrocities committed against Aboriginal Australians in films like The Dreaming. A, a few prestige productions, though, uh, supported by government funding, drew on horror elements while still kind of avoiding too strong an association with conventionally disreputable genre movies. They're sort of trying to distance themselves a bit with the horror genre while still partaking in elements of it. An example of this is Celia. Is like, uh, yeah, among the movies uh, I would recommend, I mean, I recommend more out-and-out -out horror movies. I was talking to Sam yesterday like, Patrick, if you've never seen an Australian horror movie, watch Patrick. That's a kind of good first port of call. Um, but if you're kind of expanding your range a little bit, Celia is a very interesting example. It's not a straightforward horror movie, but it makes me wish that its director, um, Anne Turner, had turned her hand uh, to a kind of out-and-out -out horror movie at some point in her career. I don't believe she has. Um, but yes... Celia is primarily a 1950s set realist drama about childhood and political prejudice. It sort of like has, takes place during Australia's version of McCarthyism, among other things. Um, but it also contains some really rather striking horror moments, including what I've got in the um, slide, a scene in which a young girl's pet rabbit is branded with a hot poker. Um, Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I can see uh, Sam looking kind of crestfallen. Then it's it is a harrowing scene. There's some some very successfully disturbing moments in this movie. 
Um, so I've mentioned funding a couple of times um, because the industrial and institutional context is very important to understanding Australian horror movies in this period. Support for genre filmmaking was very limited with only a few exceptions. Um, I mentioned Road Games already. That was an unusually well-resourced movie. It was the highest budget Australian film ever made at its time. Um, but outside of exceptions like that, budgets were necessarily low. A tax incentive, Division 10BA of the Income Tax Assessment Act, was introduced in 1981 to encourage more private financing of Australian filmmaking. Uh, this was similar, uh, if you've got any uh, people who are uh, fans of or interested in the films of David Cronenberg, uh, in, similar in some respects to the Canadian tax breaks that helped support Cronenberg's work and that of other independent uh, Canadian genre filmmakers in the late 1970s and into the 1980s. So while 10BA... Uh, did result in some more funding becoming available for Australian genre films and helped to increase the production of Australian horror movies in this period. As the Australian critic and theorist um, Adrian Martin notes, the support for production at this point was not matched by support for distribution or exhibition. So some of the films from this period were made but barely released. Um Investors' interest in the films that they were financing was often negligible, and the investments themselves could still be unreliable. Turkey Shoot, um, the the werewolf guy I showed in a slide from there, was in better shape uh, when we saw him before. He's getting a bit bad about now. Um, but yeah, Turkey Shoot, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, is one of my favourite Australian films, was financed under 10BA, but lost a substantial proportion of its available budget when production was already underway. And the filmmaker's response to this depletion of resource is interesting, particularly in relation to the topic of Australian horror. So Turkey Shoot was um, conceived as a dystopian science fiction action movie, and much of the film remains just that. However, it took on more of a horror dimension when the budget was cut. Uh, director Brian Trenchard-Smith's explanation of this was that stunts may be expensive, but blood is cheap. Um, close quarters violence and localised gore effects were more affordable forms of spectacle for this film to mount. Um, so on a reduced budget, Turkey Shoot shifted its emphasis towards memorably gruesome moments like the one in the uh, slide there with the severing of sadistic prison camp guard Ritter's hands with a machete. Um, that's uh, Olivia Hussey there on the left, um, Juliet from Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, um, finding herself in very different circumstances um, there. But yes, these moments brought the film considerably closer to the horror genre than it was originally conceived. This sort of creativity in the face of limited resources is something that I particularly admire about many Australian horror films from the 1970s and 1980s. I acknowledge, of course, that I'm not saying anything here that hasn't been said about the better examples of other forms of low-budget genre and exploitation filmmaking, and indeed about Australian movies, especially in relation to so-called exploitation. However, this shouldn't detract from our appreciation of particular examples of artistry in challenging conditions. Low budget genre filmmaking is difficult and those who make it work well deserve recognition. So I'd like to explore then in this kind of coming into a sort of a later section of the talk, some of the achievements of Australian horror films a little more by looking at some of the aspects of style that emerge to an extent out of the film's often restricted circumstances of production. So I'll start with what we might call the incidental documentary quality of low-budget filmmaking. In many cases, low-budget films have to make the best use they can of available locations, for example, over which the filmmakers can sometimes have quite limited control. Of course, Low-budget films still manipulate uh, their locations through a range of available techniques and devices, lighting, set dressing, and so on. 
but the most economical approach can be to leave them much as they are. Uh, consequently, more of the details and textures of particular places at particular times can sometimes be retained in a film, kind of almost as a side effect. Um, take, for example, this shot from towards the end of Patrick. I say Patrick, you know, one of the kind of classics of Australian horror cinema from this period. Um, and one of the more acclaimed ones as well. It ha has, has its recognition. Um, I know basically nothing about the Melbourne public transport system in the late 1970s. I know it's a significant kind of lacuna in my education, but you know, you know we all have our limits. Um, but this kind of view we get here of a number eight tram complete with visible adverts for Lufthansa and the relatively short-lived Australian soft drink export cola, which existed for a while in the 70s into the early 80s, was briefly revived in the 90s and has um, and is now kind of substantially extinct. Um, all of this condenses some evocative location and period specific detail into a kind of like, into a single image without giving it disproportionate emphasis. This film isn't kind of fetishizing the kind of local details and everything. They're just there if you kind of want to look for them. And of course, the makers of Patrick weren't shooting on that street in the Melbourne suburb of South Yarra just for the tram. Excuse me for one second. The location uh, was chosen, rather, for the large Victorian house, which was used uh, to depict the private clinic in which of much of the film's action takes place. Patrick makes expressive use of this house as a found location. Uh, shot from a low angle, it looks imposingly gothic, even in the Australian sunshine with a palm tree out front. Uh, so sticking with locations in uh, late 1970s Melbourne, we arguably get an even stronger sense of time and place in another horror or at least horror adjacent film from the year after Patrick, um, the film Snapshot, 1979, directed by Simon Winsor. So the shooting for Snapshot took place around August and September 1978 in the late Southern Hemisphere winter. And the film uses its locations to kind of emphasise that drab, grey atmosphere of a, of a winter city. And this in turn um, helps to highlight some key themes um, in the movie, including the main character, Angela, who we see in the previous slide there, um, her desire to escape her oppressively dull life, strike out on her own, and the grim and exploitative quality to many of the opportunities that she encounters. Uh, the recurring images of the uh, sort of urban and industrial spaces in Melbourne, all under these grey skies, uh, contribute significantly to the film's style and mood. So I recognise the dangers here of either sounding condescending in my praise for these movies, you know, sort of patting them on the head for doing so well with restricted resources. Or another risk here is kind of um, romanticising low-budget filmmaking. Um, but I do think it's important, though, to consider the achievements of Australian horror in the 1970s and 1980s in relation to the conditions in which the filmmakers were working. Uh, perhaps the best description overall for these conditions is inconsistent. Sometimes there was money available, sometimes there wasn't. Sometimes there was institutional support, sometimes there wasn't. Perhaps though, these inconsistent conditions sometimes uh, created space um, for some Australian genre filmmakers to express some of their idiosyncrasies and a certain element of artistic personality. I was talking about the kind of uh, financiers under 10BA, like really being quite indifferent to the movies that they were funding. And while this caused a lot of problems, obviously, it did also kind of give some filmmakers the chance to do 
broadly what they wanted. And there is certain, uh, there's certainly some evidence of personal style in some Australian horror movies from the period, and some interesting sensibilities emerged. Uh, so one such sensibility was that of Richard Franklin, the director of Patrick and Road Games, which I've both met, which I mentioned already. Franklin is is best known where he is known as a dedicated disciple of Alfred Hitchcock. And his Australian horror films are very much built around Hitchcock homages. Uh, Patrick has a backstory derived from Psycho. And as I've shown in this slide here, the clinic building, which I mentioned before, was selected partly because of a passing resemblance to Norman Bates's house and shot in ways that very much kind of emphasise that resemblance. Um, the film references different Hitchcock movies throughout and like the first thing we see in Patrick is an extreme close-up on an eye patterned after the opening credits to Vertigo, even to the extent of the, the choosing of a right eye. Uh, again, you can see these images uh, uh, together. Obviously, one is a man's eye and a woman's eye, but it's a pretty clear homage, um, influence, etc. Road Games, another Franklin movie, is an extended variation on Rear Window with the protagonist, um, Quid, the truck driver, played by Stacey Keach, observing other motorists from the cab of his truck and suspecting that one of them may be a murderer. It's an attempt to sort of do mobile rear window, basically. Um, so although Franklin's filmmaking role model remains obvious in these movies, they're not merely imitations of Hitchcock. Franklin uses Hitchcockian techniques including point of view shots, intercutting for suspense, emphatic close-ups on significant objects. He uses all of these with purpose and flair. He makes them work as part of his films rather than seeming like imported elements from elsewhere. An important part of this is that Franklin's Hitchcock homage, uh, motifs and homages are recontextualized. They're given a different significance in a new setting, a new configuration. For example, the use of suspense in parts of road games is as much comic as it is menacing. A couple of scenes are built around the tension between Quid, the protagonist, uh, his attempts to pursue the suspected killer and the absurd things that delay and obstruct him, um, including a, 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 a hitchhiker he picks up after she has an argument with her husband and then blocks the road with pink toilet roll. Um, in another scene, um, Quid gets stuck behind the man that he has nicknamed Captain Careful, a slow-moving motorist uh, towing a boat. In another, Quid uh, tries to steal a motorbike, but then skids over almost immediately, has to try and get his truck back on the road instead, and we see him kind of awkwardly pumping at a jack to get the cab back down level, while holding his pet dingo's leash in, a, in the other hand. So uh, um, again, these are these are suspense sequences. They still have the pacing and mechanics of suspense sequences, but they're also presented as faintly ridiculous. Similarly, some of the kind of Hitchcock style point of view shots that uh, Franklin uses in Patrick play on the apparent impossibility of us seeing through the eyes of a supposedly sightless coma patient, uh, Patrick, the titular character. And, and I would contend that because of the creative use they make of their influences, um, Franklin's Hitchcock homages deserve to be seen alongside those of, for example, Brian De Palma, in many respects quite uh, you know, quite similar or at least comparable filmmakers in that in that area. Um, Franklin is arguably a less lurid and sleazy filmmaker than De Palma. I use both of these as terms of praise for De Palma, you understand. Um, but yes, back to Australia. Another distinctive filmmaker associated with Australian horror in this period um, is the French-Australian director, Philippe Mora. Um, Mora's background was ex in experimental painting and sculpture, and he described his, his film work as particularly influenced by pop art. Um, he was around in London for parts of the kind of British side of the pop art uh, movement as a student. Um, the pop art influence is re uh, reflected in the kind of heightened self-referential quality in Mora's horror films, often taking the form of exaggerated violence and grotesque humour. Um, 
yeah, I've got some wet marsupial werewolf nuns from Howling Three, uh, which kind of speak for themselves, I think. Um, yeah, and I think Mora's um sensibility is probably taken furthest in the, the multifariously self-reflexive Howling Three. But another film of his, The Beast Within, also displays his skill both with knowing pastiche. Uh, in the case of The Beast Within, of kind of an American Southern Gothic style, um, and with the vividly horrific. It is at this point that we might note that the term body horror was first coined by an Australian, the critic, musician and filmmaker Philip Brophy. Furthermore, in the original article in which body horror um, is, uh, yeah, is sort of referred to, Brophy uses the transformation scene from The Beast Within as one of the examples through which he develops that concept. And the scene de uh, demonstrates Mora's ability to maintain intensity alongside an exaggeration that kind of approaches but is never allowed to reach the ridiculous. It's a skillful piece of horror filmmaking and a considered handling of special effects. We should also acknowledge, though, um, that while Mora himself can be considered an Australian filmmaker, The Beast Within is an American film. It's difficult to talk too much about the more prominent Australian horror filmmakers of the period without drifting into American examples, as many of them ended up leaving Australia and working in Hollywood. After Road Games, uh, Richard Franklin, ever the Hitchcock acolyte, went to America and directed Psycho 2. Uh, Simon Windsor, the director of Snapshot, would eventually in the early 90s go on to direct Free Willy, of all things. Um, yeah, the, the, anyone, anyone had odds on um, someone mentioning Free Willy on a talk in 1970s and 1980s Australian horror? Um, you know, I, I like to throw in the unlikely where I can. Um, so this movement of filmmakers reflects a larger situation. Where Australian horror in the 1970s and 1980s enjoyed success, it was often as an exported product. Um, Patrick, for example, didn't do very well on its initial Australian cinema release, but ended up making its money through international sales. The critic Richard Kuypers refers to Patrick as the film that proved that Australia had the capacity to produce exportable exploitation movies, even if local audiences showed little interest. Patrick's international impact was such that an unauthorised sequel slash cash-in was made in Italy, the, the land of unauthorised sequels and cash-ins. Uh, Patrick still lives. Patrick vive ancora. Uh, from 1980, directed by Mario Landi. Many of the Australian horror films from this period were made at least partly for export. One area in which this can be seen is casting. Alongside the Australian actors, there are often British and American performers brought in for their supposed international appeal. The central couple in Road Games are played by Stacey Keach and Jamie Lee Curtis while the vampires in Thirst include David Hemmings and Henry Silver. Um, the Survivor of 1981 was directed by Hemmings himself and stars Robert Powell, Jenny, Ad Jenny Agata, rather, and Joseph Cotton. Uh, yeah, names like Henry Silver and Joseph Cotton. It's fascinating that you see them cropping up here because you also see them, you know, in like Italian, in like spaghetti westerns in the 60s or Italian Polizia Tesci movies in the 1970s. They're very clearly kind of international actors for hire in this period. And actually, I'll, I'll follow that connection just a tiny bit further now, because in this respect, Australian horror movies bear at least a passing resemblance to another national variant on the horror slash thriller genre the Italian giallo. Uh, imported stars were often used for similar purposes in giallo movies to give that kind of sense of international appeal. Indeed, some of the same performers, such as David Hemmings, um, featured in both Italian and Australian horror. I've got images of the of Hemmings in uh, Dario Argento's classic giallo Profondo Rosso, Deep Red, and later him as an aristocratic vampire um, slash therapist 
in Thirst. Um, as an Australian version of the horror genre emerged in the 1970s, it engaged both with specifically Australian features and contexts and with the wider world of horror movies elsewhere. Australian horror films sought to establish their own identity, but did so as part of a larger network of cultural and commercial exchanges. Not all of them, of course, we should remember very equitable exchanges either. I'm happy to consider Australian horror to be a national genre cinema, but it has usually also been an international one as well. And I'm grateful for this uh, because its international reach has allowed me um, decades later and on the other side of the world um, to see some very interesting horror movies. That's my talk. Thank you very much.